Hello and welcome to Math 171 Pre-Calculus Algebra. Uh, my name is Blake Whitley. I'll be your instructor for the course. Um, we are going to start with section 1.1 real numbers. Before we do that though, just a couple of things. Um, if you're ever watching the videos and you do have questions about anything, please send me an email, right? That's what I'm there for is to respond to those types of questions. Um, you can also come during my virtual student hours um, and that's another good time to ask any questions that you might have. Once you start on the homework, which is all in WebAssign, there's actually an Ask My Teacher button on each question. So if you ever do have questions about how to complete a homework assignment, um, use that Ask My Teacher button there. That'll send me a question along with the problem that you're actually working on, um, and I can respond to you that way. And then if it's something that's too complicated to explain through text, then I will um, probably tell you to come join me during student hours um, so that we can actually look at those problems. Um, but the lectures um, that we do in the videos along with the homework is designed to prepare you for your test. Um, there will also be practice tests posted before each test so you have an idea of what to expect on the test itself. Um, but those will basically be all the grades that we have in this class. Okay, So if you can complete the homeworks, um, complete all your tests, and then there will be a final exam that's cumulative at the end, um, that's where all of your grades will come from. Okay, but again, if you have any questions about anything, please reach out, let me know. Um, but without further ado, let's go ahead and get started with section 1.1. Okay, so in this section, we're going to look at real numbers. Um, so we do have other types of numbers that we will look at later, but for right now, we're just focused on the real number system. Okay, so real numbers include both irrational numbers and rational numbers. And when we talk about rational numbers, we're just saying anything that can be written as a fraction. So you can see in this bubble over here in the blue, all of these numbers could be written as a fraction, therefore they are considered rational numbers. Within the rational numbers now, we have what's called the integers, okay? So those would be like your counting numbers and their opposites. So negative five, negative four, negative three, negative two, zero, one, two, three, four, five, those are all integers. If we look one step further, okay, whole numbers are basically your counting numbers and zero, okay? So starting with zero and counting numbers, zero, one, two, three, four, five, those would be whole numbers. And then the natural numbers are only the counting numbers. So starting with one, one, two, three, four, five, and so on, those are gonna be your natural numbers. Okay? And so you can see this bubble gets bigger and bigger as you go. The natural numbers are our smallest set of numbers. Then we add zero to make whole numbers, add the negatives to make integers, and then all the, add all the fractions to give us rational numbers. Anything that can't be written as a fraction now is what we call an irrational number. Okay, and so you can see some examples up there in the other bubble, pi, square root of three, square root of five, those types of numbers are irrational because we can't write those as a fraction. Okay, and you can see those are completely separate from rational, but all of these numbers now fall within the real number system. Right, and so you can see on this slide that it just kind of lays out what your different number systems are now. Natural numbers, again, are the counting numbers, integers being all of those counting numbers and their opposites, including zero. Rational numbers can be written as fractions, and then irrational numbers are anything that cannot be expressed as a ratio of integers, or in other words, can't be written as a fraction. And right, now some properties that work for all of our real numbers, we have one that's called the commutative property. Basically what that says is for addition and multiplication, the order of our numbers does not matter. So if I add two real numbers together, it's the same as adding them in the opposite order. I'm going to get the same thing. So an example of that would be something like 3 plus 5 is equal to 5 plus 3. Okay, again, both of those are equal to 8. It does not matter which order I or add those together. Multiplication works the same way. 3 times 5 is the same thing as 5 times 3. Okay, because in either case, I'm going to get 15, so it does not matter the order that I multiply those in. So that's our commutative property. Now we also have an associative property, okay, and what that tells us is it doesn't matter how we group addition or multiplication, we're still going to get the same answer regardless. So again, an example here would be saying like 3 plus 4 and then plus 5 is equal to 3 plus 4 plus 5. Right, so if you follow your order of operations, you would do what's in parentheses first. So 3 plus 4 here would give us 7 plus 5. Over here, if we do our parentheses first, 4 plus 5 is 9. So that's 3 plus 9. But in both cases now, 7 plus 5 is equal to 12. 3 plus 9 is also equal to 12. Therefore, according to the associated property here, it doesn't matter what order we group these things, we're still going to get the same result. 
Okay, and then the same thing holds for multiplication. Again, it doesn't matter the order there that you multiply based off the grouping, you're still gonna get the same answer on either side. All right, and then finally our distributive property. This says if we have a real number multiplied by a sum or a difference, okay, there could be subtraction in there also, we can actually multiply that number on the outside by each of the terms on the inside. So distributive property, we're basically saying A times B and then A times C, and then we put the plus in between them. So that's how we get AB plus AC. Now the number could be at the end also, same thing. I'm gonna distribute A times B and A times C. And so I get that same thing, AB plus AC. All right, so now we're asked to actually simplify one of these. So we're gonna use those properties and notice here, it says we're gonna use distributive property on this one. So again, what we can do, we have this number multiplied by the sum of two other values. So if we distribute here, that's gonna give us two times X, which is two X plus, and then two times three, which should give us six. All right, now the second one here, we actually have two terms times two terms. So what we're gonna do first is we're gonna distribute the A to both of the terms in the other set of parentheses. So we'll do the A times the X and the A times the Y. That's gonna give us AX plus AY. Then we have another term that we can also distribute. So I'm gonna distribute the B to the X and B to the y. So that's going to give us plus bx plus by. Now always look for like terms. Anything that can be combined, we want to combine. In this case though, none of these are like terms, so that would be our final answer. Okay, but if you ever have two terms being multiplied by two terms, distribute the first term to everything in the second set of parentheses, then distribute the second term to everything in the second set of parentheses. Now another name that you might have seen used for this is what we call FOIL, and that stands for first, outer, inner, and last. Okay, so anytime you have two terms times two terms, we can follow that FOIL method. We multiply the first terms, that would be the A and the X, so that's how we get AX. Then we're gonna do the outer terms, that's the A and the Y, that gives us AY. Then we do our inner terms, the B times the X gives us BX. And then our last terms, B and Y would give us BY. Okay, so it's the same thing as using distributive property, but if the acronym helps you to remember to multiply everything there, okay, you can always follow FOIL if it's two terms times two terms. All right, now addition and subtraction. So our additive identity is zero. And the reason for that is if I add some real number plus zero, I'm always gonna get the same real number back. Okay, and that's for all real numbers. Every real number A also has a negative. Okay, and we'll call that negative A. And that satisfies the equation A plus negative A is gonna be equal to zero. So any real number plus its opposite, those are gonna cancel out and it's gonna give us zero. And then finally, subtraction is just the operation that undoes addition. This is gonna be important when we go to start solving equations. So by definition, A minus B is the same thing as A plus negative B. All right, and then some properties of negatives. Negative one times any real number is just the opposite of that real number, so negative A. If you have a double negative, so a negative, negative A, two negatives make a positive, and so that just becomes positive A. Okay, now, anytime you're multiplying a negative real number by a positive real number, the result is gonna be negative. So here, negative A times B, or A times negative B, the result here is gonna be negative AB. But if we multiply two negatives together, again, two negatives should make a positive, so negative A times negative B becomes positive AB. And then these last two is just an example of distributive property. We can basically think of this negative as a negative one that gets distributed to both of our terms here. So we end up with negative A and then minus B. And then for the last one, if we distribute that negative, we get negative A and then a double negative becomes addition. So this is really negative A plus B. Or if you prefer to switch the order there, that's the same thing as B minus A.
All right, so again, we want to simplify here. We're going to let x, y, and z be real numbers so that we can apply all of our properties that we've looked at so far. So for this first one, remember, we can distribute that negative. So if I do that here, we have the negative times the x and the negative 1 times the 2. So that should give us a negative x and then a minus 2. Okay, same thing, even though we have three terms in the second set of parentheses here, we can distribute this negative to all three of those terms. So when we do that, negative times x gives us the negative x. The negative 1 times y should be a minus y. And then we have this double negative. Negative times a negative z should become positive. So we get a plus z. And anytime I write the letter Z, you'll notice I do put a line through it. That way it doesn't look like a 2. So my 2s will not have lines. My Zs will. All right. Now, multiplication and division. So the multiplicative identity is 1. And the reason for that is any real number times 1 will give us that same real number. Every non-zero real number has what we call an inverse, which is just 1 over that real number. And that's because if we multiply a times 1 over a, the a's then cancel, and it leaves us with 1. Okay, so we call that the inverse, and then it follows that equation. a times 1 over a gives us 1. Division now is the operation that undoes multiplication. Again, that's going to be important when we start solving equations. Okay, but to divide by a number, we simply multiply by the inverse of that number. And then we have a few different names for A over B. You could think of it as the quotient of A and B. That's one way to think of it. You could also say it's just a fraction of A over B, where A is the numerator, B is the denominator. Okay, so those are two different ways to think about division, um, either as an actual quotient, actually doing the division operation, or simply as a fraction. Those two things are equivalent to each other. All right, and then some properties of our fractions. If we're multiplying two fractions, all we have to do is multiply straight across. So in this case, we would multiply the numerators, get A times C, multiply the denominators, get B times D, and that's how we get AC over BD. Now, division, we're actually going to multiply by the reciprocal. Okay? And so you may have heard the phrase keep, change, flip before. We keep the first fraction, change that division to multiplication, flip the second fraction. But again, that's the same thing as just multiplying by the reciprocal. So we get A over B times D over C, and then you could just follow your property of multiplication that we just looked at. Okay, now, as long as we have a common denominator, when we add, we're just going to add the numerators and we're going to keep the common denominator. So notice on this third one here, we add A plus B in the numerator. We already had a common denominator of C, so C stays our denominator. If we don't have a common denominator, though, then we have to find one. And so for this first one, the common denominator would be b times d. So I'm going to have to multiply this by d over d. And then this one over here, we have to multiply by b over b. So when we do that, that's where we get a times d. And then we get b times c. That's our numerator. And then our common denominator now is just b times d. And that's how they get the bd in the denominator. Now, if we have products that have a common factor in the numerator and denominator, so notice here a times c and b times c, that common factor of c we can cancel out. And that's how we would simplify that to a over b. Okay, so anytime you have a common factor being multiplied in the numerator and denominator, we can actually cancel that out. Okay, and then finally, this last one, this is just um, using cross multiplication to solve a proportion. So we're multiplying the A times the D, we're multiplying the C times the B, and that's how we get this equation over here now. All right, so now we actually want to add these two fractions together. So remember, to be able to add them together, we actually need to find a common denominator. Now, you might be able to look at this and find the least common denominator pretty easily. Anytime you're unsure, one surefire way to do it is to multiply the two denominators. Okay, and now that's going to give us a pretty large denominator in this case. We always want to try to find the smallest one if possible. In this case, 360 would be the value that both of these would go into. So I can actually multiply this one over here by 10 over 10. 
and then to turn 120 into 360, I just need to multiply by 3 over 3. And so when I do that now, 10 times 5 is going to give us 50 over 360 plus, and then 7 times 3 is going to give us 21. And again, that's over 360. All right, so now we can actually add the numerators because we have a common denominator. 50 plus 21 is going to give us 71 over 360. Now, always look to see if you can simplify. In this case, 71 doesn't have any factors, um, and so we can't actually break that down and cancel anything out. So this would be our final answer. This is simplified. All right, now sets and intervals. So a set is a collection of objects, and the objects in that set are what we call elements. If S is a set, the notation A element of S, okay, so when you see this right here, this symbol means is an element of. Okay, so A is an element of S, um, and then if you see this symbol right here is not an element of. Okay, so B is not an element of S, meaning that B is not in that set. Now, some sets can be described by a listing of the elements within braces. So here, set A is equal to the elements 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So if you have a finite number of things, something that you can actually count, um, then you can just list them all out. Now, in a lot of cases, we're going to be talking about whole sets of real numbers or whole sets of integers, things like that. Um, so you wouldn't be able to list out every single element. So we're going to need other ways to describe those sets. All right, so here's another way that we can do it. And this is called set builder notation. So if A is a set that's equal to, we would say X such that. So whenever you see that vertical line, we read that as such that X is an integer and zero is less than X is less than seven. So if I wanted to actually write this set out now, I'm basically saying that X has to be an integer and it has to be between zero and seven and not including zero and seven because there's no equals on either of those inequalities. So this set right here, if I were to list it out, would actually be the integers one, two, three, four, five, and six. Okay, so that's the same set we just saw on the previous slide. This is just a different way to write it now, saying that X has to be an integer between 0 and 7. Now, if S and T are sets, the union of S and T, which we use this symbol right here, this is a union symbol. So S union T is the set that consists of all elements that are in S or T or both, okay? Um, so what we're basically doing is taking set S, taking set T, and just putting all those elements together in one big set, that's the union. Now the intersection of S and T, which we use this symbol right here to represent an intersection. Okay, so that's gonna be all the elements that are in both S and T. So we're basically just looking at overlap now. So if I have a set S and a set T, I would look at what they have in common. Whatever they have in common, that overlap is gonna be the intersection now. And then finally, the empty set denoted with this symbol right here is the set that contains no elements. Okay, so if you ever get a set with nothing in it, then we call that the empty set, and we can use this symbol right here to denote the empty set. All right, so here's our two sets, or three sets, um, S, T, and V. So the first thing we want to find here is S union T. Okay, so remember, that means we're looking at all the elements from both sets. Okay, so I'm taking set S, set T, and putting all of it together now. Well, if I do that, we're going to have one, two, three, four, five, just from set A, or first, sorry, from set S. And then the second set, set T, we have four, five, six, seven. I don't need to include any overlap, okay? So I don't repeat anything. So four and five I already have. And so then I'm just gonna include six and seven. 
So the union of those two sets now would be those integers. Now we want to look at S intersect T. So again, now we're just looking at what do these two sets have in common? Well, the only integers that they have in common are the four and the five. Okay. So nothing else is shared between the two sets. So the intersection of these two sets now is just going to be four, five. Okay. And then the last one, we want to look at S intersect V. So again, if we start with that first set S and we look at V, notice here that there is no overlap between those two, right? None of those elements are the same in both of those sets. So this one right here, we would just have to say is the empty set. Okay. So anytime there is no overlap and you're looking for an intersection, we would have to say that the answer is the empty set. All right, now interval notation. Certain sets of real numbers, okay, called intervals, occur frequently in calculus and pre-calculus is what we're doing here and correspond geometrically to line segments. So if A is less than B, then the open interval from A to B consists of all numbers between those two values, A and B, and we denote it using parentheses here, okay? So if it's an open interval, meaning we're not including the endpoints, we're going to use parentheses to indicate that. Closed intervals, though, okay, from A to B include the endpoints, and then we're going to use brackets to indicate that. Okay, so if we look at these first two down here in our table, whenever you've got parentheses, okay, so from A to B, that means we're including all values between A and B except for those endpoints at A and B. And so you can see over here now we have an open circle at A, we have an open circle at B, and then everything in between those values is shaded. Now, when I go to the next one, now I'm looking still at all the values between A and B, but the brackets indicate that the endpoints are included now. So the only difference is we're actually shading in those endpoints at A and B, and then we're still shading everything in between. And now we can have what's called half open, half closed. And so this A, B right here, the A value would be included because there's a bracket on A, but the B value would not be. And so we have a closed circle at A, and then we have this open circle down here at B. And then you can switch that and make the A the non-included value, B the included value. So now we have an open circle at A, and we have a closed circle at B. Now, if you ever just want to be greater than some value or less than some value, we indicate that by saying, in this case, we're going from A to positive infinity. That would be everything greater than A. So notice there's parentheses at A, so there's your open circle. And then we're just shading everything towards the right because that's where positive infinity would be located. So you just continue to shade your number line infinitely that direction. And then we can also have a closed circle at that endpoint at A if we have a bracket. Okay, but again, we're still going to positive infinity, so everything to the right gets shaded there. Now, if we want all the values less than some real number value, okay, then we're going to get something that looks like this. Again, with the parentheses, we have an open circle there, but then we're actually shading towards negative infinity, which would be to the left of our graph. So that's saying all the values less than B now. And then same thing if there's a bracket, we just have a closed circle. Okay, but then negative infinity is to the left, so we shade everything that direction. And then finally, if I just want all real numbers as my solution, that means I want to shade everything on my number line, and we would just use negative infinity to positive infinity. Notice here the infinities always get parentheses. Okay, so you're never going to use brackets on infinity or negative infinity. Those always have parentheses on them. All right, so we want to express each of these intervals in terms of inequalities first, and then we're going to sketch the graph on the number line. Okay, so if we look at this first one here, we've got negative 1 to positive 2, and in this case, the negative 1 has a bracket and the 2 has a parenthesis. What that means is we're going to take all the values between negative 1 and positive 2. We want to include the negative 1, so this is going to be a less than or equal to symbol. And then we do not want to include the 2, 
So that's just going to be a less than symbol. So whenever something's included, we use equals. Whenever something's not included, we just use a simple inequality, less than or greater than. Okay, so then the number line for this one, we have our two values, negative 1 and positive 2. Again, the negative 1 is included, so I'm going to put a closed circle at negative 1. The positive 2 is not included, so that's going to be an open circle at positive 2. And then we want to shade everything between those two values. All right, now our next interval is from 1.5 to 4. Notice this time both of these have brackets, meaning we're going to include both endpoints. So our inequality is going to be 1.5 less than or equal to x less than or equal to 4. So because they're both brackets, they both get the equals. That means when I go to create my number line this time, again, we need the 1.5. We need the 4. Both values are included, so they're both going to be closed circles. So closed circle here, closed circle here. And then we want to shade everything that's between those two values. So just shade everything in between. All right, and then our last one, we've got negative 3 to infinity. Negative 3 has parentheses, which means it's not going to be included. So this is really just x is greater than negative 3, because we're looking at negative 3 all the way to positive infinity. That's all the values bigger than negative 3 now. So when I sketch this graph, we only need negative 3. Negative 3 is not included, so it's an open circle. And then we're shading everything to the right of negative 3. So everything towards positive infinity. All right, so now again, we want to graph each of these sets. So the first thing we need to figure out is what are we even looking at? Okay, and so usually for me, it's easier just to graph each one of these individually and then think about the union or the intersection. Okay, so I'm going to look at just the interval from one to three first, and I'm going to sketch that. Okay, so I've got my one, got three. Both of these are going to be open circles because of the parentheses. So we have an open circle at 1, open circle at 3, and then we're looking at everything in between. Now I'm going to draw my other number line directly below that, and I'm going to try to line up where the values actually are here. So this one goes from 2 to 7. Well, 2 would be between 1 and 3, so I'm going to put my 2 here, and then 7 will be bigger than 3, so it's going to be down here somewhere. Now this time both of them are brackets, okay, so I'm going to do close circle, close circle, and again we're shading everything in between. All right, so now remember with the intersection symbol, that means we're only looking at the overlap between these two sets. So now what I want to look at is if I were to combine these two graphs, where would they overlap? What would they have in common? Well, Basically, that would be everything from there to there. Okay, so those are the values that they actually share on their graph. And so when I sketch the graph of that overlap or of that intersection, we're actually going to start at 2. We're going to go to 3. The 2 is included in both. Okay, so that's going to be a closed circle at 2. Notice the 3, though, is only included in the bottom one and not the top, so there's not an overlap between those, so that's going to have to stay an open circle. And then it's all the values between 2 and 3. That's what gets shaded for that overlap or for that intersection. All right, now, the second one here, same intervals, except now we're looking at a union instead. Remember, the union is just putting both of those sets together. So if I go back to the two that I graphed before, now we're not just looking at overlap. We're just saying, if I combine those two graphs, what would it look like? Well, putting all of those values together now, one is the smallest value, but it's not included. So that's an open circle. 
7 is the largest value. It is going to be included. And then we're just going to shade everything in between, including the 3 this time, because the bottom graph actually includes 3, and we're only looking at if I throw all of these data points together now, what is that graph going to look like? Since 3 is in one of them, it has to be in the union. So again, intersection, just remember that's only the overlapping region. And then union, we're looking at both graphs just put on top of each other, all the points that are part of either one. All right, absolute values. So the absolute value of a number, any real number, is denoted by the vertical bars around it. We read that as absolute value of A. Okay, and now whenever you're looking at absolute value, we're really just looking for how far is that value from zero? What is its distance from zero? That means that these are always going to be positive. Okay, so distance is always positive. Therefore, the absolute value is always going to be positive. So if A is a real number, the absolute value of A is either going to be just that number if A is already positive, right, greater than or equal to zero, or we're going to have to take the opposite of that value if A is less than zero. Okay, and I know it's kind of weird to look at this and say, well, wait a minute, we just said absolute values have to be positive. Why do you have a negative there? Well, if you think about it, if I take the absolute value of something like negative five, in order to calculate that absolute value, I know it's going to come out positive, but I can actually just take the opposite of whatever value is in there. So I can take negative, negative five because we already said whenever you have a negative negative, that double negative becomes a positive. And so the absolute value of negative five actually becomes positive five now. So whenever you have an A value that's less than zero, whenever it's already negative, we add another negative, that makes it positive. And again, if it's already positive, it just stays positive. All right, so let's go through each of these now. So the first one, absolute value of three, that's already a positive value. We're just gonna keep the value the same. So absolute value of three is three. Again, that's three units from zero, that's its distance. That's why we get three there. Now, absolute value of negative three, again, we're taking the opposite of the value that's in there because it's negative now. Its distance from zero is gonna be three. Right, and then the absolute value of zero, well, zero is zero units away from zero. Absolute value of zero is just zero. Now, this last one's a little trickier, okay? So we've got three minus pi. I want to keep this as an exact value, right? So I don't want to get a decimal, right, and think about what this would be in terms of that. I want to think of it in terms of pi. Well, we know that pi, though, is slightly larger than 3. It's approximately 3.14 something. So when I do this subtraction, 3 minus something larger than 3 is going to give us a negative value, which means what I'm going to have to do then is take the opposite of whatever's inside there. Okay? Because remember we said if you have a negative value on the inside, we take its opposite to make it positive. So I'm going to do negative 3 minus pi to get my absolute value. And so at that point, I can actually distribute the negative. That's going to give us negative 3 plus pi. And now if we think about that, negative 3 plus some value that's bigger than 3 will give us a positive value overall. And so this is our absolute value of what we started with. So again, just determine, is it positive or negative to begin with? If it was already positive, we just bring the values out as is. Because 3 minus pi would be a negative value, though, we have to take its opposite. So we put a negative on the outside, distribute that negative, and now we have something that would be positive, and that represents the absolute value for us. All right, now some properties of absolute values. The absolute value of A, again, has to be greater than or equal to zero, right? We can never have a negative value for an absolute value. Absolute value of A is equal to the absolute value of its opposite, so absolute value of negative A. If we have the product of two values inside of an absolute value, that's the same thing as taking the absolute value of each individually and multiplying those together, okay? So you can actually split up that absolute value if there's multiplication. 
Same thing with division. If you have the absolute value of A divided by B, we can actually split that into two separate absolute values and divide them after we take the absolute value. And this last one's what we call triangle inequality. The absolute value of A plus B is actually always going to be less than or equal to the sum of those individual absolute values. Okay, so we don't know for sure that it's going to be equal to, but we can at least say that it's always less than or equal to that sum if we split it up. All right, now distance between points on a real line. So if A and B are real numbers, the distance between those two points um, is going to be calculated by B minus A and then taking the absolute value of that. And that's just to make sure that we get a positive distance um, based off of where B and A actually are on the real line. All right, so we want to find the distance between negative 8 and 2. So again, it's up to you how you label your A and B. I'm going to let negative 8 be the A value. I'm going to let 2 be the B value. So we said the distance from negative 8 to 2 would be the absolute value of 2 minus negative 8. 2 minus a negative 8, remember 2 minus a negative would give us a plus, so this is really just the absolute value of 2 plus 8, which is the absolute value of 10. And then once we have the absolute value of 10, it's already positive, so we know that distance now should be 10. Now, just so you see, it doesn't matter which point we label A or B. I could have switched those up, because if I do negative 8 minus 2, that's going to give us the absolute value of negative 10, and I still get positive 10 as my distance now. Okay, so it does not matter the order there because we're going to take the absolute value anyway, and once you take that absolute value, you're going to get a positive distance. All right, so that's all we have for section 1.1. Again, if you have any questions, please let me know. Come see me during student hours if you need to. Send me those questions in WebAssign on the homework, and I will see you next time.